fortunate enough to have the exclusive sit-down interview with uh, our good friend Jason Christ. Jason, um, if you can, in some way, shape, or form, uh, emotionally, uh, what, what's been going on in your world over the last 72 hours? And, and is there any way to put into words kind of what you guys have been going through? Really difficult, really, really difficult emotionally for me because uh, obviously to be here from the beginning, um, to have built things the way that we did, to feel like this team and a lot of the, the philosophy and ethos of the group is, uh, was started when we took over, it's, it's so difficult to walk away from. So emotionally, I think we, myself and my family are so vested in the community here and in the club and in all things Real Salt Lake that it's been really trying uh, and a difficult process to come to the decision that it's time to move on. Um, and so it's, it's been very emotional between myself and the kids and Kim. Uh, and then yesterday was a day full of um, telling everybody uh, that I've been really close to in the club uh, officially that we had made the decision to leave uh, through last night where we had all the entire uh, team up um, and the team staff, the coaches and trainers and strength, condi uh, strength and conditioning coach and um, equipment manager um, to announce it to them last night was probably the culmination of all the emotions. Um, and to see all their faces and get their responses and spend time with each of them was one of the best experiences that I will uh, have ever had uh, as a person uh, in particular. So to walk away from all that last night is, leaves me with a, a very good feeling about what we've been able to accomplish here. Not so much on the field, but uh, been able to accomplish and, and truly um, having an influence on people's lives. Basically spending half of your life in Major League Soccer. Um, you know, take us back. When, when the decision came or the opportunity came to leave FC Dallas, uh, Dallas burn, uh, the transition, <laughs> to really start uh, as a player, an organization, um, and, and starting that footprint. What was it like for you uh, personally to know that you were coming in underneath Dave Checkets as the guy that this club was gonna be built around on the field? Eerily similar to how it feels right now, honestly, to leave somewhere that I had been for nine years, the exact same time that I've been at Salt Lake. Um, and to have felt like I was there in Dallas at the beginning of that uh, club and was a, a pretty big part in, in all the things um, Dallas Burn at that time now, FC Dallas. Um, really difficult to leave that place emotionally, um, but there was this big new opportunity and challenge in front of me. Um, and I remember the, day, the very first day here um, coming for the press conference and to look around for houses and uh, one of the very first meetings I had was to walk into a room with Dave Chekets. Um And I think that from the first second I was in his presence, I knew that there was something special about this man. Uh, and in turn, something special about this club. Uh, he was uh, an incredible presence. He, the f first questions he asked me had nothing to do with soccer or my career. They were about my family. Um, and I could see that this was the type of person that I wanted to be involved with and I wanted to work for from minute one. Then to leave that meeting and walk out to the actual press conference and have a full room of fans and press people uh, was amazing to me. And I know I remarked about it at the time, but I remember it like it was yesterday. It was, it was clear to me that it, there was something different um, about this club from day one. Uh, and it felt like a, a terrific, terrific decision uh, after going through all the doubts of that one, um, day one, uh, it was clear to me that I'd made the right one and that this was going to be something special. In 2005, uh, it's this voyage which includes some, some great names on the field, uh, but not a lot of success. Um, you know, an artificial surface, a college football stadium, you know, all these things going on in those first couple of seasons. You, you always said that your relationship with Dave Checkets, like you just reiterated, was something special. But did you ever think that there would come a day where a conversation with him led to you retiring? Some may say a year or two too early. And the next thing you know, you're in charge of not only your teammates, but some of your best friends. Yeah, I think I did. Um, I know in the latter stages of my career, um, I was pretty certain that of what I wanted to do next. I think as any player ages and gets past that 30, um, age line, you start to think about well, what's going to be next. 
unfortunately we're not making enough money in this game to to have it any other way so um i was very uh determined that i wanted to be a coach um and to think about working directly for an owner like dave checkets um i think you become a little bit more determined and a little bit more steel steely in in your focus um so a year and a half before that actual conversion uh to become a coach i had had a conversation with dave and there was a very um clearly laid out plan and and in typical dave fashion was grandeur and idealistic and uh all those things um but i i do think from the summer of 2006 uh, um or summer of 2005 maybe it was no it was 06 cuz it was around the real madrid game uh it was clear to me that that I was going to be here a little while longer um and involved in the coaching staff in some fashion so as the season evolves that first year what was it like for you uh, because we always kind of joked around that you went into a bunker for the per- for pretty much that first year <laughs> you know you you were you were trying to catch up to speed not just the coaching side of things and and trying to create your road map but just learning the ins and outs of the league the mm-hmm. language the money yeah. how, how to deal with everything um wh- walk us through your mind wh- uh, how how difficult of a time was that on the field off the field and, and for your family incredible uh absolutely unbelievable to to be doing that transition when it happened um the way it happened to hit the ground running uh i i literally felt like i was working 20 easily 20 hours a day. Um would sleep 4 or 5 hours a night, would go to bed late, would wake up in the morning thinking about what's next and all the things that need to be accomplished and flying out to New York to learn the rules on the fly, flying to Argentina in the middle of the season to to meet Javier and Fabian and um all those things uh I don't know that I could do it again. <laughs> Honestly, I think it takes a special um kind of energy to to learn all that and um try to move things forward on the field and all that together um i will say that, that i think my wife tells the best story that during that time she literally had to ask for time to speak to me um because even when i would come home i would be straight into the computer to scout players uh and it was a very very strenuous time so i'm extremely thankful that my wife and kids <laughs> stuck with me through it because without them there's there's no doubt i would be nowhere close to where i am right now um you you were kind of the godfather of the 442 in in major league soccer the diamond formation mm-hmm. um introducing it Clive Charles had done it with the Olympic team and a little bit with Portland but we hadn't seen that in America at the professional level on a consistent basis why why in particular did you settle on that formation and you touched on hobby mm-hmm. but guys like Kyle and Nick and Nat mm-hmm. um and, and creating that culture inside the locker room mm-hmm. how does one go about doing all these things to create kind of the path that we've seen RSL have success in yeah first Brian i think it's probably it might be a little unfair to say that i was sort of the godfather of that formation because when i think about th- that diamond in midfield i think about like the the really successful years for the Houston Dynamo um with Ricardo Clark kind of in the hole mm-hmm. and De Rosario in front of him and Brad Davis off to the left but always coming inside and i think the right kind of changed a little bit but similar sort of philosophies where the midfield would move a lot and very dangerous teams but always one guy that held um so i don't know that that it, what i've done is innovative as far as system goes at all okay to for me to think about the process it, it, i didn't come into coaching thinking this is the shape i'm going to play you know the diamond the 442 that's for me uh not at all um i i wanted to build the team with quality personalities and quality men um and quality soccer characteristics and then i think from that point when we got to the summer of um not the summer but the off season after uh 2007 um when we were starting to really put the pieces together i looked at the 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 the, the biggest quality players uh and they had to be quality influences in the locker room quality people so I looked at Morales uh and Beckerman and um center backs at that time. I don't even know if we had Borchers yet uh or Lava. I think we added them both in that off season. But Romando with his characteristics and goal, um Robbie Finley and Yuramov Sisian and Fabian Spindola, 
and looked at that sort of core group of players that were the most talented players uh, in that group and said, how do we build this the right way? Um, and for me, the first step was to identify the core and then add the pieces and make a decision for the formation based on the, the highest quality players. We had that core group of players. And so to look at a, uh, a group that included other guys like uh, Kerry Talley, Dima Kovalenko, we had a lot of quality sort of more central midfielders. Um, and in, in combination with my kind of going through the qualities of the players and what would be the best tactical shape, I went down to Argentina during that offseason and did notice there was a lot of teams playing this, they call it down there, a 4-3-1-2 or a 4-1-3-2. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I thought, and this I think is a system that could really work and benefit and bring out the best qualities in, the, in our absolute best players and then look for, for players to, to complement them. Thank <laughs> you.